Welcome, everybody, to a brand new Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spend the jams and spill the tea. This week, we just finished our two new reviews of two new albums that is already out on this channel. We reviewed the anticipated follow-up uh, to Billie Eilish's debut, Happier Than Ever. We also covered the new album from Jack Antonoff's project, Bleachers. We talked uh, about Take the Sadness Out of Saturday Night. And now we are talking about, is this Morgan's Record Club? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's Morgan's Record Club. We are talking about the second album to talk about uh, from Mr. Bungle on this podcast. We previously talked about it at the behest of August, I believe. Uh, a mm-hmm. couple of months back, we talked about their self-titled and what a wild fucking ride that was. And now we're talking about California. Morgan, why did you choose this to talk about? Well, because Mr. Bungle is never not going to be interesting to talk about, for one thing. <laughs> And for another, it, it felt somewhat incomplete to me to uh, talk about the, the debut and not talk about California, mm. um, which for, for all intents and purposes is a more well-regarded album even than the first one. It seems to be regarded as their best from what I can tell, yeah, at least it, narrowly. Yeah. I think it's weird, like, the self-titled record, I think, has more notoriety and maybe is more significant and important in terms of, you know, its impact. And, you know, the being one of those records that all involved are known for. Um, but it's interesting, both that album and its follow-up, uh, an album called Disco Volante, which is not a dissimilar album. It's also 70 minutes long. Uh, and it's, I don't quite feel that it has the same sense of um, sweep that... The self-titled record does but it certainly doubles down on the craziness like disco volante is an absolutely abs- just even for mr bungle that album is just ballistic uh but yeah so disco volante and mr bungle are these ab- just absurd huge colossal albums that are kind of forces to be reckoned with we kind of discussed a little bit the i I guess overwhelming and even intimidating nature of that when we reviewed uh the mr bungle album it's a record that almost dares you to turn it off at points almost dares you (laughs) to step back and disengage it almost tries to purposefully overwhelm you and California, I think, is a very different album. I mean, I think that's oh, yeah. quite apparent as soon as you put it on, but not even just in terms of how it sounds and the sonic approach, but this is a very different record structurally to the other two Mr. Bungle albums. It is much more tighter. It is more paired back in terms of the general ambition. It is a succinct series of ragers, and it sees the band uh, move into a kind of more of an art rock, surf rock direction as well with lots of weird uh, combinations of sounds that are kind of new for Mr. Bungle. Um, and I'm still like there's, kind lo- of... there's a lot of doo wop in it as well. Yeah, like, there is. Mm-hmm. There's all the all of these weird sort of '60s influences that are being filtered through the band's sort of more heavier approach. That makes for I think a, a really intoxicating experience, uh, and in multiple senses, right? I almost feel like I'm getting drunk when I'm listening to this album. It absolutely <laughs> has a real sort of swagger to it and a sense of enrapturing appeal that I. I mean, from the first time I heard it and every single time I've listened to it this week, I have been absolutely swept swept up in it. I think it's a remarkable album that I didn't have any idea this band had in them. I mean, even the Faith No More records, if you're just wanting to look at Mike Patton, they're, I guess, defined by the sense of, of grandiosity and hugeness that California has, I guess, in some of the sounds, but very much lacks in the size. It is this more modest record that I think allows for the band to focus their musical ideas, focus on individual musical ideas and explore them in more depth and greater detail than any given musical idea on any of their previous records, because they're so busy on those albums and moving from one idea to the next. Here you have these individual songs that are much more convenient conventionally structured although still full of craziness um and and certainly nothing at all that sounds uh i guess like anything else uh, it's just too much of a unique combination of sounds and aesthetics but still each musical idea and each song is focused and explored to its fullest extent before the band move on cleanly to a new idea 
um well to a new song but i mean the songs are all i guess linked by these the similar aesthetic which is another way that it differs from previous mr bungle records is that the aesthetic is consistent the aesthetic is uh, a part of the record's identity a part of the record's sort of core concept um, and so that I think is the general appeal of California and the reason why I think it's worth having a conversation about as well as Mr. Bungle because they could almost be mistaken for records by different bands because their entire approaches are fundamentally different as I see them, even if you can see the seeds of the same personalities and the way that the record's written and the way that the performers engage yeah, with Still undeniably a project spearheaded by Mike Patton. Oh, oh ab absolutely. Yeah, so you may remember when we reviewed the self-titled, I didn't love it. I didn't even really like it very much. I think to, I can't quote my exact thoughts, but it basically summed up to, I have no way into this. I don't know what to do with this in my life. How do I listen to this? Right. How um, does and, us our music? Yeah. And I was really worried early on with this record, I'd have a similar reaction where it's like, wow, I'm, I feel like I'm listening to someone just like flipping stations on a road trip. But no, <laughs> I ended up fucking loving this record quite a lot. Um, and I think that really focused nature really helps from like, ah, a musical idea I can really like bite into like a sirloin, you know, like there's proper variants and shit that's focused around something and really sink my teeth into um, for a whole record. I love the 60s influence. What I love is like they're channeling a sound that is very melodic, but fundamentally to do with like evoking an emotion that you sit in those kind of like teen ballads where you sit in that feeling of heartbreak. And they're like, yes, but th like that, but metal. And it's like, yes, another genre where I'm like, I'm, I'm here to sit in a mood that is also fairly dark mm -hmm. and unhappy and unpleasant. And it means that these two aesthetics blend much better than you'd ever expect them to. Because they're both fundamentally about sitting in your own feeling of melancholy to a various degree, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like every song is really good at it. There's, there's one song I don't like very much, which is Gollum 2, but the rest of the album, I, I'm just head over heels in love with, and I'm, I'm really glad I listened to. Yeah, I'll tell you what I was weirdly reminded of while listening to this, um, and obviously this is a record that came much later, so I would suspect that this record might have been a point of inspiration, is it reminded me a little bit of the last Arctic Monkeys album, Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino, yeah. where the band kind of adopt this loungier vibe, and there's this sort of torch song element to it. I was specifically reminded of this with the opening track, Sweet Charity, which is just one of my favorite Mr. <laughs> Bunk songs. Uh, it has this real sense of spaciousness to it, this groove, again, that sort of surf rock aesthetic, that kind of loungy cocktail vibe that it has, but these soaring vocals and the sense of circular motion as well. It has this real sense that you're being swept up in this or being taken to this very specific location in the same way that the Arctic Monkeys record does. And you're being, I guess, seduced or at the whim of these, these men or these people who are uh, in control of this whole thing. And uh, I get so swept up in it. And I think that Sweet Charity immediately throws you into that in this very beautiful and seductive way before the second track, none of them knew what they were robots, just kind of pummels you and, and, and yeah. you know, shows you the other fist. And, and I, yeah, I'm immediately thrown into this with this great sense of, of character and theatricality that of course that theatricality like you you that's one of the first words you probably think of when you think of the performers on this record and the music they make and Mike Patton but I think it's really focused into a core meaningful conceptual thing in terms of soundscapes and structure and song ideas and genre with this record than it ever has been before I mean I would say even more so than my favorite Faith No More records yeah, I mean, what that theatricality does, that I think actually really taps into something that's very contemporary in music right now, is it uses theatricality and detachment and irony to induce a feeling that is totally sincere at the same time. Sure. Um, actually, in the same way, it's like, weird comparison, 100 Gex. Um, like, that's some music that is led in irony, but it's all in service of a very sincere emotional target, you know? Mm. 
And I, I feel like that's this, especially Sweet Charity with the very exaggerated doo wop backing vocals on that song. Yeah, I mean, the uh, song itself is a reference to like a, broad, a 60s Broadway play and it has like lines like forever after in your Technicolor heartbeat. Uh, and so it has, it sets this very s- specific scene. And I think that it's a whirlwind album, right? You're, you're thrown into these very different manifestations of this landscape, of this place that you're in. Um, but I, in, in many ways, it feels like this opener really sets you up for all of that beautifully while still leaving the actual ways in which that manifests musically as a surprise for the rest of the songs mm. to deliver um Absolutely. i yeah i <sighs> it's very strange I, I don't mistake my tone here for uh, a, a lack of enthusiasm or whatnot i i really really like this album i'd say i'd like it about as much as i like uh the self-titled just for basically entirely different reasons it, it is that sort of focus that Tyler and Sersha were getting at that does lead me to sort of immediately, like this was something that grabbed me uh, a little bit more, despite it being generally speaking less like aggressive as the self-titled, like the self-titled is a little bit more like a jack of all trades. It's constantly cycling in and out of uh, focus and in and out of intention and sometimes even genre and you know sometimes it becomes fucking you know Mike Patton shitting in a toilet that said there's a an a, a sort of euphoric mania to that album that really just sort of gets you introduced to Mr. Bungle's approach and this sounds like an album where that repro or that approach found maturity in how they went about executing it I think my favorite uh, the best song on the album for me anyway uh, the song that I like the most and that is so emblematic of this entire album is actually uh, the second track none of them knew they were robots which is like conceptually whack but also just like I believe at one point we described the last Mr. Bungle album as sounding like demented carnival music well yeah. this is like that but it's just like turn the fucking dial and break the fucking machine man let's yeah. fucking go I couldn't tell whether um whether this was just because the last record club we did was on at the drive-in but the lyrics of the song specifically reminded me of like <laughs> that lyrical style just this real yes. total fucking surreal absurdity with a lot of jargon that's used to put in there to just throw you off and lines like with my machines i can dispatch you uh, and <laughs> very ziltoid yeah actually that's a good point as well um they stole the great arcanum the secret fire moloch found his gold for the new empire the necrophage <laughs> becomes saint <laughs> i love doom oh they um, i mean recombinant logos keys bitic cabalistic trees that's the fucking bet like one of my favorite things about uh, this particular album is that it's so like even when you're not quite on the same page as it like well like I'm I, I think this is like a perfect song and I'm still not like trying to latch on to like what the fuck it's like getting at because that's the thing with Mr. Bungle is that a I always know that there's a reason for what they're doing beyond the sheer absurdity of it but they never compromise on said absurdity despite the fact that it's in service of something but i i just really love the 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 fullness of how much of a fucking insane blitzkrieg this is and you know it's it's got that sort of sense to it where it's like you know you don't really know how to parse through some of these lyrics but it's like the enthusiasm is so infectious that it doesn't really matter even if you don't dig into it it's just kind of like yeah man talk about the new franklins flying their kites Mm. I know what that means. There's a real sense of like back and forth in the way in which this album attacks and recedes at certain points from you as well. Like totally. Sweet Charity is this kind of like seductive opener that lulls you into this beautiful world, like that this commercial that's being sold to you by this singer. And then none of us were, none of them knew they were robots. It's like bashes you over the head with the reality of this experience on this planet once you actually get there. I don't know why I said planet. It just, to me, it's like, it's like visiting another planet. Um, and and I, think, I, I think you'd have to be being pretty generous to say that lyrics like fucking buying an X or an O in statecraft, tic-tac-toe, cat's game for Joe Blow, post-industrial bliss, a binary hug or a kiss can be wrung from utility mist. I think you'd have to be pretty generous to be saying that's anything other than just word salad. Um, and I think that's 
points it, right? It's it's all part of the overwhelming impact. And what I love about this album broadly, and I'll let you get back into it, Jake, is that there is a great balance between the these really emotionally forthright moments on this record, like Retro Vertigo and Pink Cigarette in particular, which I'm looking forward to talking about where you get a real sense of humanity and like the reality of, of the experience of this place mixed in with this real cacophony that couches it. Um, and and I, I think that that's really meaningful. And I, I've got specific ideas about the overarching concept of this record that I'll touch on later, but that's what I think is so, makes the second track so hard hitting is the fact that it just bowls you around like that. There definitely is some truth to saying that there, it has kind of a word styled approach, but I actually don't know if I agree with that just because the impression I get from a lot of these lyrics is like, it's like, I, I don't want to say like free association, but it's like all of those lyrics, they, they invoke this sense of mm. artificiality. They evoke a sense of like mindless consumerism and I think that's not too far to say that that's what the album is going for I think that especially in the sound too that it's reflected and like you said in the whole back and forth from this first track to the second track mm. it's like it's lulling you into that world and then um the the second track is showing you the 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 cd underbelly of that I mean it's like a fucking the opening shot of blue velvet and shit but like it's sort of taking the idea of California and the aesthetic of music that would come from there, like surf rock and California as this place that's this like monument to, you know, consumer culture, to fame, to vapidity, to mm. all of these things that are, that are huge targets for stuff that Mr. Bungle as an act would totally lampoon on any of their albums and just sort of using that as like a, they're like slipping into this like a glove so that they can go at it as from like a, from a slightly different kind of approach. Like I love lyrics, like you have, um, from history, the flood of counterfeits released, the black cloud, reductionism in the beast, automatons gather all the pieces so the world may be increased in simulation jubilation for the deceased. It's like, if you try and put that together in like a like a word by word kind of way, you're probably not going <laughs> to come up with much. But to me, when I hear that, I think this is evoking some sort of like weird, dystopic, like fucking future Akira world or something where everything like the soul and the life has been kind of sucked out of it. And using that kind of demented carnival lens that they have always had through surf rock is such a great idea. And I think that's what leads me to like, if I had to pick a preference, I think I would say I would like this album slightly better, even though I think I'm probably going to give it the same score as uh, the self-titled because I just like the more focused approach better. Like the, the unhinged thing is just sort of like, you know, that's just sort of what do you prefer? Because I think the way they did that on that album works for that album. But here it feels just a tiny bit more effective to me uh yeah. as it's sort of cycling through this it's like it definitely has the mania it definitely mm. has the appeal that that first mr bungle album had but the maturation of both approach and theme is what makes it so exciting and what makes you feel like it's actually like a, a development uh mm. to an extent uh not surprisingly my favorite tracks on here though are tend to be the ones that go a little bit harder and that's not to say the softer songs are like less good i just think that like they serve a purpose of like building that faux aesthetic. They sort of build that and then so that they can come crashing in with it later. Uh, no better on a song like Ars Moriendi, which also fucking whips. God, what a fucking track this mm -hmm. is. Also like, this, I, I, mean, I mean this as a compliment. Does this song mean anything at certain points? Because God, it sounds like, like is this a made up language or is this Latin? Like, because like, what the fuck, Mike? <laughs> I oh, mean, that, it, is, it uh, that like, is Latin. I can okay. clarify. Yes. That, that, that does. I, I haven't translated it. So I don't know like what it's, it's getting at in that regard. But I just think the idea of performing it in song like this in a dead language is just so fucking like, yeah, fucking course you would. You fucking weirdo. But I mean, the point really is that it's just absolutely fucking insane. Uh, it also just kind of surprises me that like, I didn't really know. I didn't pay attention to when the first Mr. Bungle album came out and knowing this came out in 1999 is like, I don't know if that, like, if it's just my lack of overall past musical knowledge, but this album feels so like 
I know it's not totally out of step with the rest of Mr. Bungle stuff, but like it feels weirdly ahead of its time. I mean, not even for like just the avenue of music that they work in. It's just I, there, there's something about the way that like they harness the sort of uh, melancholy on some of these songs that feels like it was borrowed like decades later into like almost the pop sphere of, you know, like where it's focusing on, like you have artists like Lana Del Rey who are sort of focusing on this sort of inherent artificiality of cultural like tent poles and ideas and tropes and sort of metastasizing and, and pushing in and trying to see what parts of that are hollow and what parts of that maybe have a little bit more to them and honestly like here I find it a little bit more interesting obviously just because it's more of my scene with like you know metal and shit but it, it, it feels a little bit more poignant like it's willing to to interrogate it in a way that is like outside of the safety zone of, of, of pop. So I, I find it yeah. in, uh, in an interrogative sense to be very ahead of its time. And yeah. I don't know, there's no real like weak point on here for me. I, I, I think that maybe I do share Sersha's like not, like I don't really love Golem 2, the bionic vapor boy, but I can't say that I don't enjoy it. So, eh. I, I mean, yeah. I can't. I, I, I just want to say, Jake, you're kind of like, with whether knowing it or not you're kind of dancing around like the whole concept of the record as i see it like you kind of got it you've kind of got it which is and and the comparison with lana del rey and like modern pop singers that draw from this kind of aesthetic is really like super on point i think and what i love about this record is that to me i see it as a satire of the image of paradise right it's this <laughs> landscape that is supposedly a paradise that you're lulled into and then it is the ugly reality of uh, you know the supposed utopian vision and the use of California and the Californian aesthetic ties that to the music industry, ties that to the media world as well, which I think is a rich subtext that the album draws from without ever mining in a blunt way. And, and I think that for that reason, I find this album most potent and effective and it's quieter, well not quieter, but and it's more sort of like soulful moments, uh, particularly songs like Retro Vertigo, which I think really spells out this theme quite clearly. And my personal favorite song on the album is probably uh, Pink Cigarette, which I find deeply moving and upsetting. Uh, it's like you go yeah. through all of these yeah. tableau on this record from these intimate scenes, from these distraught manifestos, from these bits of heavy, overwhelming propaganda. And then you get this song in the middle of the record, which is this just utterly wrenching suicide ballad about this person who you know kills themselves and talks about how their lover is going, sings to their lover who's going to find their, his body. And it's just, I, don't, I just find it completely devastating. And to me, it's like a, a great centerpiece point around which alongside Ars Moriendi, which is that heavier side of it that kind of doubles it in the same way that none of them doubles Sweet Charity. But it's this point that really where the whole, I guess, emotional point and through line of the record in terms of its concept really comes together. And what I love about what Mr. Bungle are able to do here is they're able to perfectly balance the satire the satirization the you know the po-faced um ridiculousness of the thing that they're satirizing and the world that they're presenting to you on these tracks they balance that perfectly with the emotional subtext with the the core of the significance and the meaning of what they're trying to say and what they're trying to get across and throughout the record they display that balance from song after song beautifully in a way that I mean I was stunned at how much I connected emotionally with this weirdly absurd album even though I barely understand what actual songs are even about aside from you know a few of them like even though I barely understand the real rich subtext of the songs beyond what I've been able to pick up so far I feel a real deep emotional connection to this which is surprising to me because I've never really connected emotionally with a, <laughs> a Mike Pattern thing which is not to say I don't enjoy them I love Faith No More I love the real thing I love Angel Dust I love uh, Mr. Bungle's first record, um, to a certain extent anyway. Uh, and so I, I was really bowled over by this album, and it still is impressing me in, in new ways every time that I listen to it as well. And uh, yeah, I just, it really took me by surprise. And 
anyway, that's all I have to say for now. Just as an end note, I think to what you were saying, I think something that really helps uh, Pink Cigarette be as emotionally impacting as it is, lyrics are great, but the music has this real debt to like um, Morricone's score for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes! You're so Um, fucking, you're spitting right now. That's exactly the vibe. Thank you. Thank you. And just to tell that so really intimate emotional story with lyrics, with music that implies the scope of that epic Western, it, it just captures the hugeness of the emotions. One hundred percent, completely agree. I get I get huge battle of Menti from it. Um, mm. Additionally, um, from most of this album, you know when it's not fucking arpeggiating like a fucking between the buried and the record <laughs> and on that note i am glad that somebody else mentioned a david lynch film so i didn't come up here <laughs> completely unprompted and be like this album is lynchian in this essay i will because i i, I say that i frame that like a joke when in fact i'm a hundred percent serious i think the closest equivalent to the album itself is mulholland drive for a multitude of pretty apparent reasons, especially when you sort of place them together and how sun scorched and overexposed they are from a purely, you know, surface level standpoint. And when you dig deeper than that, it's horrifying and tragic and generally icky. Mm. If I were to make another cinematic comparison, since we'd like to do those, also relevant because we talked about this director uh, early in our main episode for this week. Uh, this also reminded me a little bit of the experience of watching Leos Carax's film Holy Motors, um, this mm. sense of absolute uh, carnage that's happening, that's unfolding in front of you, but is also presented in this almost theatrical way, like this kind of play that you're being thrown into and subjected to. And obviously the musicality element of that movie is a huge aspect of it and its appeal as well. And so I think all of these different works of art are unified by the way that they use this theatrical, uh, even uh, indulgently silly aesthetic to probe and poke at certain ideas and to upend certain perceptions and uh, I guess idealistic, idealized images. And California, I think, is the best of all of those works at doing that. I bet David Lynch would love this album. Yeah, it's very, it also feels very beef heart in some ways. So that sounds huge influence. Consider yeah. for a second his soundtrack choices for Lost Highway. And then wonder if he <laughs> yeah. likes Mr. Bungle. Yeah. August, I I mean you I see you as one of our bungle experts considering your love of that first mm. record. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to hear what your perspective is on this album. Well I'm waiting for this one. First, I need to give some shine to a track. Uh Jake kind of dissed a little, that being uh oh. Golem 2, the Bionic Vapor, which the Bionic Vapor Boy rather, which I think is one of the band's most sharp, sharpest, most hilarious criticisms of uh, com- uh, commodification and uh, commercialism, in particular of religion, that title Golem 2, uh, obviously evoking the Jewish folklore character of the Golem, and, and making a, a sequel to that is obviously hilarious enough. Uh, but that's further reinforced by the Giga Giga Gilgamesh, as if to imply this idea of Gilgamesh being made into this Giga Gilgamesh. We got to make something grander and more epic and more sweeping. While also the Gilgamesh. Song, yeah, there you go. While also the song being a parody of the actual reality and cycles of religion eventually repeating itself with Gilgamesh being a very notable figure turning into the Bible's Noah and himself being adapted from the earlier Utnapishtim. Uh, So I thought that was just a really sublime commentary there. It was, to me, this was a really funny, sharp, on-point song. 
and also the line, our king by night, our slave by day, being this this commentary of like, oh, we, we praise this person before we go to bed, this higher power. But during the day, it's like, oh, God, I need this or this or this. Mm -hmm. So I just thought this was a really sharp commentary, both of commodifying religion and just religion, religious culture itself in general. Uh, one of the album's highlights, in my opinion. Uh, uh, co sign completely, totally agree. We'll also just add as well that I think you can also use an, an analog of that to layer that whole aspect onto the theme of the media industry and the ways in which um, people are commodified as well. It oh yeah, that's, that's what I was taking it into. Sorry, continue. No, it's, it's, it's totally all right for you to make that connection because I, that's, that's very evidently what this album is about, this really technologically driven hell we live in. In a weird way, like the 91 self-titled album, this stands as a very predictive album of what was to come in culture. I think that's, that's made really apparent on, yeah, tracks like None of them knew they were robots. And among many others, I love Air Conditioned Nightmare. I think that's just a really catchy song, of course, with the line, rots your brain just like a catchy tune. This uh, description of this just fucking nightmarish Hollywood environment. And I think what's great about this song in terms of its purposeful production is just how heavily compressed it is mm -hmm. and how heavily compressed this whole album is to really suffocate you and make you feel trapped totally and that's agree. that's cal i think that's this album's like best aspect this whole overarching narrative of how every and one of the my favorite things about bungle as a whole is that every piece of their music leads to this just leads to their broader societal picture they're trying to paint every detail making you feel more and more trapped it's so yeah it's so fucking good um uh, shout out um, on air conditioned nightmare as well to i think my favorite lyrics on the record which i think again encapsulate beautifully everything this record is trying to go for conceptually which are the lines uh, or the extended passage Walking on air up from the wheelchair, I'll find the suicide that I deserve. Walking on sand, forgotten where I am, but it's so comfortable here in the sun. Where's my rainbow? Where's my halo? Which is a, a great line about how, I guess, suffocating and soul destroying that this environment is. And yet the way that it kind of, it just d breaks you down to the point where you're too weak to fight back against it. You're comfortable here in the sun, um, despite the fact that you're being oppressed or you're, you're lulled into it to the extent that you begin to seek out its indulgences. You begin to play along with its systematic, um, the message that it's pushing, the desire that you should be finding your rainbow. You should be uh, seeking to become a part of the machine uh, and, and equates that with suicide. Um, and, and, and yeah, I just, I love, the song but that particular passage really i find really powerful like many moments on this record. yeah no i i think yeah that suicide theme you've mentioned that that is kind of seen throughout this whole album as like the only out which is a really bleak depressing picture to be painted i mean kind of comes with the territory of mr bungle records painting this just hellish hellish portrait of things mm -hmm. and i think that's also made all the more powerful by the kind of evocations of nostalgia earlier into this album on uh, tracks like retro vertigo and which i think is obviously just in title alone the best example of that on this album amazing of, amazing song yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a wonderful song and just the title alone chimes with so many thematic ideas that are immediately thrown up just by the sonic palette of the album. Yeah. Like it it just deals with all sorts of ideas of like the poison mm. of nostalgia 
you know um yeah i think it's the most sort of blunt thematically that the lyricism gets but i think it works in this context because it's it follows the most you know obscure song lyrically on the record and it has this emotional tone to it it's rooted in the emotionality in a way that also feels fresh and startling from this band and really gets you i i find myself moved a lot when i listen to the song like it just really got me man fuck sell the rights to your plight and you'll eat again it's blunt but the way that it's employed is really effective i mean it's been interesting to see in like the last few years the concept of a very sonically similar word of uh refer to go come into the common lexicon Mm. um yeah it's it's a good point I mean, it's not the same word, but it's very similar. And it's- essentially, like, it means the same thing, I think, essentially, in terms of how yeah. it's used. Is that, yeah. Damn. One more thing I, I will get to is the song uh, Ars Mori- Moriendi, of course, meaning the art of dying. Once again, taking that very suicidal, heavy theme uh, and placing it right, song. placing it right in your lap. Uh, I love the like traditional folk influences on this song, which obviously, once again, quite unexpected, but still manages to mesh well with the 60s pastiches. They're already 50s and 60s pastiches. They're already throwing on top of this. And yeah, yeah it just paints a really vivid fascinating picture yeah i completely agree um and i'll just i guess close out my thoughts by talking about uh the stretch of the record i haven't really touched on yet which is the final stretch of the album um and i think first of all the greatest phones bad song ever written before phones were even a thing is the holy filament because the lyrics (laughs) are sparse here but they're fucking fantastic. I'm just going to read them because there's not only like um, 10 lines. In fiber optic illusion, the flickering eyes by fluorescent lights supplicate before machines self-reflecting. The legend of modernity, the phosphines explode, God's eternal strobe through the holy filament graven image. It's essentially a poem. sounds like fucking death, uh, fucking on symbolic. Yeah, uh, th- thousand eyes. Oh, is that shit, it does too. Holy shit! Yes, yeah, it's, it's this. Yeah, it's essentially just this poem that was written by Trevor Dunn, actually, um, <laughs> he, who wrote the lyrics to this track. Mm. And it's again, it's very concise and it's incredibly meaningful. And essentially, it does boil down. And as I read it, it's like a phone's bad, screen's bad song. But also, like, there's a layer of depth to it that goes beyond that, and then f- reflects back on the entire album that precedes it. And so, like, this is probably, I guess, the most, in- the least, if I had to rank them, least instrumentally compelling piece on the record. And yet, these are some of my favorite lyrics on the album. So, ultimately, I don't even have an issue with it. Um, and then the last two tracks, I think, are interesting and really speak to the, I guess, state of mind or perspective that the band or that Mike Patton uh, has on this concept. Vanity Fear uh, is a great song. It is almost this climactic moment for the record where um, the a central character embedded in the fabric of this world breaks out against it. Uh, I love that he describes this as the moment of my de-sexing, uh, <laughs> which is just a great way of putting that. Uh, and then instrumentally, this song rules. Oh, so yeah. Well. I mean, I'm, yeah, I can't just, talk about turned. everything, but yeah. He just fully turns into George Michael on it. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I think there is a legitimate case to be made with just these 10 songs that Mike Patton is the greatest vocalist who ever lived. Yeah. You, you're fucking yeah. on it, mate. Um, the first verse, he kind of castigates this, these figures who, uh, I guess, run or present this landscape. You're not human. You're a miracle, a preacher with an animal's face in your sexy neon smoke screen. Lie the super salesman of vanity. Even your shadow worships you in your jungle solitude with the orgies of the sacrament and the seal of flagellants you know god saves those who save their skin from the bondage that we're in 
uh, which is a great verse. And then the, the absolute catharsis of the way the song ends with cut this cancer from my soul. Now I finally made it. I'm finally naked. I'm finally naked. He has shed the worldly falsehoods that have clothed him like the things that he's been subjected to the propaganda the 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 world that he's fallen into but the twist of the thorn is the closing track which is Mm. reveals the ultimately cynical view that Patton ultimately has of this which is that this person has freed themselves of this particular bondage but then are become subsumed in a kind of self-destructive pattern of their own behavior which is drug abuse which this song is quite obviously about even from the title alone uh and it ends the album in this unbearably bleak way uh the lyrics may your sun be blown out like a candle may your sea burn like tar may your sky be rolled up like a scroll may your blue moon drip with blood i mean some of the most just scathing lyrics that Patton has ever written and ultimately it ends the record in this incredibly dark and dour place and then just chicka 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 yeah, that was and the one I knew I was listening to Mr. Mungle record was when that kicked in. Like that that moment is one of the most satisfying conclusions to an album ever, I think. Oh, it's like that that is like an automatopoeic representation of machine gun fire, as though this whole place is just being laid waste to by some kind of godlike force that's just kind of you know apocalyptically layering over top of it and destroying everything and it's like he's representing that through vocalizations and of course the, the guitar explodes the way the song changes musically to in the back half as well and just gets really fucking dark and heavy and it's just nightmarish and it makes a perfect again it's a really dark place to end this record on uh it's almost uncomfortable but it, it again it's it, perfectly mike Patton as well what's, what's so great about how that how it ends there is there's never the album never shows you that part of its hand before that point which is what makes that that it gives it that extra push because there are plenty of these songs where you could have led into something heavier but that that restraint to hold that back until Goodbye Sober Days is so good. Reminds me of, once again, the ending of Mulholland Drive. <laughs> yes. Huh. Yes. yes. There you go. Um, we come full circle. So, something I just You've wanted to just mention now that we're at the last song, right? It's like, my pattern is like the equivalent of like the autorial of voice. Most people credit to like Mr. Bungle and... Um, Faith No More and bands like that. But I, I just think it's like very important to note that like a lot of people very used to making metal records did a wonderful job at sublimating the genre traditions to make this record. And they did a amazing job at taking on the clothes of genre here. Oh, absolutely. There's no, absolutely no doubt. I mean, as we discussed, on, I think we discussed this at length when we talked about the first Mr. Bungle album, absolutely a collaborative effort that works as a result of the unique and unified, especially in this case of this record, unified talents of Mike Patton, of Trace Bruins, of Trevor Dunn, of Danny Heifetz, of Bar McKinnon, those five men and all the other players on this record as well. They're an integral part. Uh, I mean, especially because you have lyrics here that are credited, like, as I said, um, Tre- uh, Trevor Dunn wrote uh, Holy Filament and also wrote lyrics, wrote Retro Vertigo as well. Bar McKinnon wrote Air Conditioned Nightmare and has a writing credit on the closing track too. And Trey Spruance also has lyrical credits on Golem 2 and none of them knew they were robots. So in, in basically every respect, this is the real collaborative effort. Um, yeah. That's that's absolutely should be clear. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, like the self-titled, that that chemistry they have from knowing each other, like in high school and having this deep personal connection with each other is very apparent here. Totally, totally agree. <sighs> Mr. Bungle, California, favorite tracks and ratings, Jake. Uh, my three favorite tracks are None of Them Knew They Were Robots, 
uh, Ars Moriendi, and uh, I'm going to say Vanity Fair. Um, yeah. Least favorite track, uh, Golem 2, The Bionic Vapor Boy, and I give the album a 7.5. Oof. Dope uh, shit. All right, some favorite tracks of mine here. None of them knew where they they were robots. Golem 2, The Bionic Vapor Boy, and Goodbye Sober Days. Least, oh, least favorite. That's tough. That's, that's very tough, actually. Shit. Yeah. I... <laughs> now that I'm looking over this track list, it's like, Christ. What, I, 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 I guess I'm going to pull a guess I don't have one. <laughs> I guess I'll say <laughs> Ars Moriendi myself, uh, just because I don't know. Fucking I don't know. Uh, eight out of ten. It's very good. Potential to get even higher than that with time. So my three favorites are Pink Cigarette, uh, Retro Vertigo, and uh, I would say the Holy Filament, because um, not just lyrically. Uh, I also find that song really instrumentally compelling, too. And they're fucking... There is not a second on this track that is not compelling. On this track. On this album that is not compelling. So, no least favorite. Ten. Thank you. Good day. Um, for me, uh, my favorite tracks were Sweet Charity, um, Vanity Fair, and Pink Cigarettes. My least favorite is Golem 2, and it's getting an 8.5 from me. My three favorite tracks are Pink Cigarette, um, Sweet Charity, and I'll say, oh God, fucking me, Jesus Christ, <laughs> Retro Vertigo, I guess. Um, yeah. I don't have a least favorite track. I'm giving this a 10. And oh. you know what? You know what? This is the, f I had to check the spreadsheet just to make sure. This is the first time, I'm absolutely over the moon. This is the first time that an album I've ever listened to for the first time for a record club has instantly within those days become one of my favorite albums of all time. It's never happened before exclusively because of record club. Um, so this is, this is a first for me. I, <laughs> I fucking adore this shit. It's just me. Yeah. Amazing. It's gonna be me. It's so, gonna be me. I'm gonna get it. Thing to say, we previously reviewed subtitled, as we've said, that got a 7.8 average. This album has received an 8.8 .8 average. Oh, oh man, Tyler, Tyler ate it. Oh damn. That, that's I just that's, uh, like that was all the way in. POV, your Mike style. Patton's penis. <laughs> so other albums that have received an 8.8 .8 include. Song for Our Daughter by Laura Marling, uh, Cavalcade by Black Midi, uh, Familiars by The Antlers, Ultra Visitor by Square Pusher, Drinking Song by Matt Elliott, and Yoshimi Battles of Pink Monsters by The Flaming Lips. Love the pink monsters. Robots! <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> none of them knew Aren't none of them knew they were it? monsters <laughs> <laughs> Raph work be like we are the monsters <laughs> anyway uh let us know at home what you think of mr bungle's california what is your favorite mr bungle album i'll make sure to put in the description of this video a link to our previous record club on mr bungle which you should go check out if you haven't already um, but yeah, let us know what you think of the Mr. Bungle records. Let us know what you think of our conversation. Let us know if you have a different interpretation of any of these songs or of the album as a whole. We want to hear from you in the comments below. Make sure you leave a like. Make sure you subscribe as well if you aren't already. And yeah. All right. As always, everyone, rock over London, rock on Chicago. Gatorade, is it in you?